So I, first of all, want to tell you that I got all of this, almost all of this, from Chart School and for from Alexander Elder's book, The New Trading for a Living. And the reason is uh, that I got that from there is it was part of the CMT curriculum reading in order to get uh, my CMT. Admittedly, I'm still on level three. <laughs> I don't know if I'm ever going to get past it with my schedule these days, but uh, I found a lot of this information in the level two book and there is more information in the level one book too if you want to really get into this stuff. So I just wanted to let you know about that first and foremost because uh, Dr. Elder is a friend of my father's and uh, I think the, uh, a lot of him, he is actually a psychologist, so a lot of what I'm going to discuss also includes some of the psychology that's involved in volume. All right. So I'm going to talk to you not only about the volume indicators, which I know everybody's interested in, but you really need to know a little bit more about volume. So I'm going to talk about the definition of it and the behavior, and then I'm going to go ahead and get into the indicators. And there are so many volume indicators. So I pretty much picked either my favorites or the ones I know that there are always questions about. Um, I, of course, use OBV, and I'll be discussing the weaknesses and strengths of all of these as we go along. So let's get started with, uh, you know, what is actual volume? And I think one of the, I think everybody understands that it's uh, a unit is, you know, the number of shares or contracts traded. So each share is a unit. And the thing that we forget is that it requires somebody to sell a share and then the other one buys the share. So there's two individuals involved here. So if you think about it this way, if we have a certain amount of volume for a day, and it's on a price rise, well, half of that volume, half of those people are losers because they sold their share and then it went up. So that's something to keep in mind as well. And then it reflects the degree of financial and emotional involvement. And what I mean is that, you know, it, it does kind of give you an idea of the pain level among the participants or the euphoria, I suppose you could look at it on the the other side of it as well. So let's uh, discuss a little bit about the volume psychology. So the greater the volume, the more pain, because 50% are losers on either side. Think about that, right? So that's why volume is really not a measure of the price action, you know, obviously it's not price, but it's, uh, it doesn't tell you the level of value like price does. Volume just tells you the excitement uh, or lack of going on. So the first thing I was going to talk about is a short squeeze. I think that some of you have heard that. So basically the pr prices start to rise. The shorts are now giving up because uh, obviously their position is starting to get more of a loser, more of a loser. So they buy to cover. Well, now the rally is going up. So more of those shorts give up and so on. So there you go. You end up with a rally out of the short squeeze. So those who think the market's going to go down, obviously, are going to short it up. And so they have to cover it if it starts going the wrong direction. And vice versa is, is true, really. A trend that moves on steady volume is likely to persist. So one of the things we talk about is volume leading price. So when volume starts to fall, that means your supply of losers is low. So you've already given them, they've already given in, you know, the volume is now starting to dry up. So that's when you start to expect a trend reversal. Now, when the longs start to sell, and prices start to decline, then more people get worried. You know, we see this in the correction, it encourages more to leave, and then it just sort of uh, continues to grow on that. So that's what we mean by volume leading price, you know, the amount of volume and where it's going based on where price is going tells you a lot. But you look for volume to lead price, but of course there's times when it, it does not. So volume spikes or bursts of a high volume, that tells you that there might be, the trend might likely be ending. You know, you're getting a, a you're in the middle of a decline and you start, you get this burst of high volume, all this excitement. Uh, it's kind of an explosion, and so you you basically find that the trend is gonna gonna switch out. So 
that's one of the things you can look for. And when I say a spike, that means, you know, you've had very steady volume and then all of a sudden it's earnings or whatever it is and boom, you know, the volume just goes crazy and that will tell you, you know, there's a good chance you're gonna see a reversal on what happened. Uh, and downtrends, you know, it's an explosion of fear. You've got all these people that, you know, you're, it's moving down and all of a sudden you get this spike and that means people are even more fearful. So you might see a short-term emotional reversal from the smart money. High volume is typically about 25% above your average over two weeks and low is typically 25% below average volume over two weeks. And the typical, uh, I think that uh, Stock Charts uses a 200 day moving average on volume. So here's the important takeaways that I want to, as far as just volume in, it, in a sense of what it is, we're going to, again, we'll talk a little bit more, but high volume is what confirms a trend. So the spikes suggest a short-term trend reversal. So you might get a quick pullback on a, a spike to the upside. Uh, so that's what we're talking, a very short-term reversal. It doesn't mean the trend's going to completely end unless you start seeing that high volume continuing as uh, prices maybe start going lower than, again, it's it feeds on itself. So the market will set a new, let's say the market sets a new low and then volume sets a new high. That's telling you that that bottom is likely to be tested. And this is where we start looking for those divergences. And that's the reason, because we want to know if there's a divergence, that's telling us something is going on that we should know about. Volume shrinks while the trend continues, you know that's uh, time for it's ripe for reversal. There's less interest, less interest in that price rise and then ultimately your buyers run out. You get that buying exhaustion and then you're gonna see it uh, fall back. Uh, let's also continue with uh, some of these takeaways. Volume during reactions against the trend. And this is what I mean by um, a divergence. So if you have an uptrend and then it's punctuated by a decline and the volume picks up and then you see the dip continue and then volume starts to dry up, that tells you that the bulls aren't leaving and your selling pressure is spent and that's a buy signal. So if you're looking at an uptrend, okay, and it's punctuated by a decline, okay, and then volume starts to pick up, and the dip continues and the volume maybe starts to dry up slowly. And then that's when you find out, okay, well, there's still bulls in here because the, the volume is drying up. So the selling pressure overall is that that exhaustion has been cleared up. The selling pressure is spent and that becomes a buy signal. Now, if you have a downtrend punctuated by a rally on high volume, then you know that uh, you're starting to see that uh, the weak bears are starting to drop out and the volume starts to then shrink after you've done that, then you're looking at a sell signal. So I'm gonna show you some of this on a chart. I think it'll make more sense uh, when you see it charted. Um, so let's look at some of the volume indicators now that we know a little bit more about volume. And the first one, one I'm going to talk about is on balance volume. This one is uh, my favorite, mainly because back in the olden days, <laughs> before Excel, uh, I was doing uh, the running total of the volume using barons and a ruler to go through the, uh, I think we were tracking just the Dow 30 at the time, uh, but it still took uh, at least like 15, 20 minutes maybe 30 minutes depending to calculate it all on my uh, on the counting paper that we had my father and i so it's a much easier uh, calculation so it's <clears throat> basically a running total of what's going on with volume if you have an up day you take all the volume from that day and you add it to your cumulative total on a down day you just subtract all of the volume so price is really the, like i was saying price is the value of the consensus, but volume is the emotional intensity about what's going on with price. So that's what you use the on balance volume for. So you can see, uh, <clears throat> you know, you can start seeing those trends. All right, so let's look at the next one. 
this fine tunes the OBV. Okay, so the OBV is a simple, right? Add, add on all daily volume, subtract uh, when you have a down day, pretty simple. But what, uh, and this is Mark Chaikin's design, by the way. Um, he changed what, uh, there was a formula back uh, that was uh, created by uh, a man named, let's see if I have his name in here, Larry Williams in 1973. He came up with the idea of accumulation and distribution, but his formula was slightly different. And apparently it wasn't considered as good because we don't even have that indicator on our, the original accumulation distribution we don't uh, cover. And rather than com confuse everybody, I won't go through that old uh, formula but uh, there is, if you go back into the books, in fact, uh, I found, um, you know, Dr. Elder's book talks about Larry Williams' version, uh, but I, he does get into the Chaikin money flow as well. And this is sort of the precursor to the Chaikin money flow. So if you understand this, uh, you really will understand the Chaikin money flow, uh, how it works. So we're fine tuning the OBV. So rather than just take all of the volume for the day, and subtract or add it, um, you're gonna just based on who won that day. Now we're gonna take a fraction of that volume and then based on who did the best, the bulls or the bears, that's the volume that we're gonna um, use is that fraction of volume. So if it's positive, you know, you, the ADL, the accumulation distribution will be positive if you get a close in the upper half of the uh, bar, if you wanna, an OHLC bar, so the upper half. And the ADL is negative if the close is in the lower half. And this represents your buying pressure and your selling pressure. So here's the actual formula. And I think it, it, uh, this will help. And I'm gonna give you a more visual uh, in just a moment. But you basically take the close minus the low. And then from that, you take out the high minus the close. And then you divide all of that by the high minus the low and then you multiply by the volume for the day. So as you can see, you're gonna end up with only a fraction and, and that gives you that intensity uh, because then you can add that, you know, uh, multiply that volume. So now you're seeing how intense uh, or how, what the accumulation is or what the distribution is going on. So that's why they of course call it the accumulation distribution line. So let's go look. And I'm gonna annotate this because the annotations are being weird. All right, so let's look at this uh, a little more clearly, make this more readable. All right, so the accumulation distribution, right? So this is the close minus the low, and that's the first part. And then we subtract the high minus the close. And then from there, we divide it all by the high minus the low. So that gives you an idea of how that fraction comes up and you can see how you, you get uh, those that, for example, this was a, a, a negative day, right? There's your open and, and there's your close. So it was a negative day. So the bar is in the bottom, the close is at the bottom half. And so that means we know our ADL is gonna be negative well, you can already tell that because, uh, you know, you're getting a, the close uh, minus the low is a smaller number, obviously, than the high minus the low. So that'll make that negative, And then we divide it by the whole uh, volume. So you're basically taking that fraction, uh, that particular um, uh, subtraction, uh, the close minus the low, and then high minus the, uh, the close. So you're taking these two all right, and you're subtracting this from that. And again, that gives you your negative number and then you divide it by the whole thing, okay? So hopefully that makes that a little bit more clear. So now, hopefully you understand the accumulation. And so if you understand this, and I think it's, it's I hopefully I simplified it somewhat for you, then you're gonna know the chicken money flow because the chicken money flow is only the, uh, it's, it's a, an, a moving average of the ADL, a 20 period moving average. So you take the 20 period sum of all those ADL values, and then you divide it by the 20 period sum of all the volume. 
And that's where you get your chicken money flow. So it's basically a 20 day moving average of the accumulation distribution line. All right, not too bad, not too hard. Force index, and this one was created by Dr. Alexander Elder. Uh, I, don't, I don't use it, but I think it's a, a brilliant idea. <laughs> Another way to look at volume. And what he wants to do is, you know, he talks about the fact that volume, you know, is a measure of that emotional involvement, uh, the pain among the participants. And so what he wanted to do is um, somehow v be able to visualize that. And so what he does is just takes the difference between the price closes from one day to the next, and then he multiplies it by the volume. So if it's a high volume day, of course, that force index value is going to go way up and the opposite would be true, of course, if um, the volume is very low uh, and you get that price change. So think about it, you may have a very small price change, but it comes with a lot of volume. That's telling you something. There's some interest here. There's something going on and we need to look at it. What he recommends is rather than just using, you know, one period, difference of the close multiplied by the volume. That can be really, um, and I'll show you, it's a little wacky, uh, a lot of spikes. And so what he recommends is taking a 13 period EMA of that. And that's what the default is if you go to a chart and start adding it on there. So what's the psychology behind the force index? And I think you could use uh, this psychology uh, in, in terms of the uh, check and money flow as well in in a lot of ways so because again we're looking at divergences and that's usually uh you know where the good information lies so let's think of it this so the force index reaches a new high and i put parentheses the you know if it goes the other direction the vice versa so when the force index reaches a new high that's confirming uh the uptrend because you're in an uptrend and the force index is, is uh, moving to a no, new high, that's telling you that there's some intensity, there's some excitement, um, because those values, remember, are getting higher. So if you make a new high on the force index, that's confirming what's going on in the uptrend. So if you get a new force index peak, that again, like I said, the bulls are strong and the rally is gonna continue. What you look for are the bearish, the bearish divergence here. So the force index starts um, making lower tops and then the price tops are still rising. So that's considered a bearish divergence. So your force index tops, declining tops lines, think that way. Uh, that's a way to look for whether you're uh, looking at a divergence or a convergence, but that's, that's for another workshop. So here we go. So you have your price highs are rising, boop, 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 and your force index tops are falling, boop, boop, boop. So there's, that's a negative divergence. Now, one thing that uh, he does talk about is in order to measure the tops for his indicator, the force index indicator, you need to have a reset. And uh, Tom talks about this a lot. You need to have it reset, go through the zero line between those peaks or those uh, bottoms. Or, so you need to have that happen. So if, you're, if you've got this force index and it's riding above the zero line and you get this peak and it's, you don't measure these peaks. Uh, you don't measure until you get that drop below the line and then it starts to peak again. So hopefully that makes some sense. And again, I know this is uh, on a, I'll be showing you the actual charts and hopefully that will um, help with that. All right, so that's the bearish divergence. You're seeing these price highs moving higher, but the force index tops are falling. So you can tell that there's not as much uh, uh, in, uh, energy behind that price move, okay? Now, if your force index reaches a new low um, and it's continuing lower, the downtrend is likely to continue. But you need to watch for the divergences and a bullish divergence you will look for price making new lows, but see the force index lows rising. So on the in indicator, you're having rising bottoms and on price, you're having declining, um, you're having rising tops. So 
when you look for these divergences, it can be confusing. And, and I'm, I am also, uh, I'm not going to say, I, I do tend to not follow the rules exactly. But the idea is on the indicator, you're looking for either the declining tops or rising bottoms. Remember, those are the only two lines you'd pay attention to if you drew a trend line. Um, we don't look at rising tops for anything unless it's the top of a, a trend channel. So we're looking at the indicator and we want to compare declining tops or rising bottoms because again, that's those are the trend lines that matter. So you're looking at the indicator first for those and then you compare the tops, what's going on in price and the lows or what's going on with price as far as the lows. So hopefully that's somewhat um, helpful. And again, I, I'll try and explain all of these on a chart so that it's a little bit more clear. So there's the, again, you have to have that reset when you're looking at the uh, force index highs and lows to draw those uh, lines, the trend lines. All right, uh, so the volume by price overlay is very simple and I will show it to you, but it delim delineates the amount of volume at each price level. And basically it's a histogram on the left side of the chart. And so it tells you at this price level, based on the histogram, how high was the volume at that price level? And what I like to use it for is uh, mostly just to see support and resistance that may not be uh, visible when I'm just looking at price tops and bottoms. So sometimes you get a really um, strong bottom on, on your chart and it seems like it's sitting in the middle of nowhere. It's, it doesn't seem to be on support or resistance at all. You kind of are like, why, why is this strong bounce occurring? And I can almost guarantee when you put up volume by price, you'll find that that histogram bar is one of the highest at that level. So I'll show you an example or two of that. And I would recommend as well, if you have any questions uh, about what I was talking about, like I said, you can read the, the book uh, by Alex Elder. You can check out the CMT curriculum, uh, but the free way, the free way is to go to chart school. We're gonna look at indicators and overlays. And again, this is a great way to get to whatever it is. So here are your overlays. And again, I will show you an example of the volume by price. So accumulation distribution line. And so you can get all of the information. Uh, this is the calculation and how you come up with it. Um, for some reason to me, this looks a little more complicated than the one I put up. So <laughs> it's up to you, <laughs> you can use this. It's the, same, it's the same formula what I showed you earlier. And then it gives you some uh, great examples. And, and then the actual spreadsheet for what's going on and as well, the in interpretation. So for example, remember we were talking about the accumulation distribution versus the OBV. So I'm gonna show you a, a chart that I put together. Let's get this here. Yeah, I don't know what's going on, but my annotations are getting kind of messed up here <laughs> on this chart. I don't know if it's because it's such a, a small one, but we'll see. Uh, so let's look at Amazon and I'm going to add, uh, this will be a great way for you to see how to do this too on your own charts. All right. So I cleared all of my uh, overlays. I'm not going to do the volume by price overlay yet. You have to wait. All right. So I'm going to move the OBV to the top. We're going to do accumulation distribution and then we're going to do check and money flow. And then we're going to take, uh, let's see, what was the other force index? We'll look at the force index. There we go. All right. So, and again, notice that these are the, um, remember, 20 period at moving average of the AD line, at the ADL line. So that's, remember, I talked about that for chicken money flow, and that's the default. I don't know why that keeps going in like that. Okay. And then the force index. Uh, remember, he likes to, he recommends that 13 period EMA. And I did promise you, I will show you a chart with both of them if I have some time. The, the one period and the 13 period. So let's update this. 
And I imagine there's a, a ton of questions in the, the question box. Um, be sure and put your email address in your little profile. You should see the uh, next to your, at the top of the Slido window, uh, you see in the very upper right hand corner, um, just click on your first name letter, whatever it is that's showing up there. And then you can put your email address in your profile. Nobody will see it but us. And I will try and answer your questions offline in case I didn't get to them or there was some confusion. So let's look at uh, the similarities and differences here. All right. So first of all, uh, on balance volume, like I said, I like to use it. It's simple in my mind. I can visualize it very easily and quickly because I used it all the time. And it's really very similar, as you can see, to the accumulation distribution. But there are times where they will diverge. They won't work quite the same. I can see right here, I'm going to get my little annotation tool going here. Right away, I can see a, a divergence here. So you've got declining tops, right? Over here, you kind of have rising tops, mostly flat. What's happening to the tops during this time? We're seeing them go down, right? But the tops, so right here, if you're using accumulation distribution, this would be a bearish confirmation because the tops are, are moving lower on the accumulation distribution, but the tops on price and the tops on price are also moving lower. So that's considered a, a I guess in this case, a bearish confirmation because everything's going lower and it's, it's kind of proving the point. Uh, the problem is, of course, you come out with a, a rally. What happened with OBV? Well, interestingly, it actually had a, a, a positive divergence because we have the, the tops here are rising, but we're seeing the, the tops over here declining. So that's kind of a similarity. And as I said, we can look at lows during that period of time as well. And we both are in agreement as far as the OBV. All right, so what's going on with uh, check and money flow at this point in time? Well, we can see we're getting these peaks over here. Again, um, with from what I understand with check and money flow, you don't have to wait for that reset in order to connect uh, those tops. If this were the force index, we couldn't connect these tops. We couldn't um, we couldn't use these as far as our divergence because we didn't see a zero line cross here. Uh, so what we can do, so you look over here at uh, the force index, and if we're connecting tops, for example, we can't connect this one with that one because we haven't had a, a reset in between. So you're looking for the reset. So we can compare this one to this one because we've had a reset or two in here. So let's see. Let's see what's going on here. We've got declining tops on the elder force index. And we have what's going on with tops during this period of time. They're rising. That would be considered a negative divergence. You've got declining tops, but rising price tops. So your expectation when you have this type of a negative or bearish, I guess you could call divergence, you start to expect, you should start to expect a decline. And while it didn't occur right away, well, I guess if you wanted to get really into this here. It did come in pretty close, didn't it? To call this uh, this correction or a decline in February as far as Amazon is concerned. So interesting stuff, I would say. In the case of the check and money flow, I'm not so sure it told me what I was uh, looking for as far as divergences here. It, the tops are pretty even here. So I guess you could say they're going down a little bit. So hopefully that gave you a, at least a visual of how these work. And I will just very quickly show you a chart with the two force index values on there, just so you can see the, the differences. I'm gonna clear this, it's a little easier. And we're gonna put the force index here. There's that 13 period one. And we're gonna do a one period one, which is just that main calculation. All right. 
And we don't need the scooter. All right. So see, as you can see, it, it's really spiky. So if you're trying to determine the, uh, you know, tops, bottoms, divergences, this is kind of messy and it, it would give you a lot of signal changes. It would be very confusing. So it's much better to smooth it out. I think Dr. Elder um, found a really good smoothing um, EMA. Uh, I like it. And as we can see, it's pretty, it, it's pretty good here. So let's see. And that's where we were seeing another. Let's look at a couple divergences and then we'll pass it back to you, Tom, and we'll talk about what I know we're gonna talk about. <laughs> so what's happening from here to here? That would be declining tops, rising price tops. That's a negative divergence. Expectation is a decline. And I guess you could say over that time period, we got the decline doesn't always work that well, but I, I think it's pretty um, useful. Here's one, rising bottoms, declining price bottoms. That's a positive divergence. So you should expect a rally off of that. And that's what we got. So that's the, the, um, the great use of volume and the volume indicators. I think it's an excellent um, indicator i know somebody had asked me well how much um how much uh, is it your number one indicator or what do you, what do you pay attention to more i include volume in my analysis but it's not my my go-to i have the obv on there my prior if i'm prioritizing uh it would be the pmo the moving averages the ex exponential moving averages is what i use and then I look at my volume and then I look at the scooter. So that's sort of my, um, I guess, priority of indicators. So hopefully this was helpful and uh, I really enjoyed putting it together. It was a great way for me to refresh my memory on this stuff. And like I said, for further reading, uh, I would recommend you go check out, uh, let's see here, back. Well, I don't have it in here, but I, I recommend you check out in the Stock Charts bookstore. Go look for Dr. Elder's book. Uh, and if you really, like I said, if you really want a great, uh, complete look at technical analysis, these are great because they basically take all of the good parts of, say, Charlie Kirkpatrick's book, Dr. Elder's book, uh, Perry Kaufman, uh, Jeremy Duplessis for point and figure. So it's, it combines all of those uh, into one big book. So these are really helpful too. And uh, if you really want to get into it, you, you can certainly uh, go for a chartered market technicians uh, designation.